good day, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? Great! I hope you said well. I'm doing well. If you didn't say well, I hope today's vlog will make you feel a little bit better. We're gonna go and see the last home of one of the funniest people in film history. I've wanted to go out and see this house for a while. I actually have some stories to share because I got to meet some of this person's family members. So I'll share some of those stories with you. But we gotta first take Jile to the park, let him go have some fun, and um, yeah, and then we'll get our day started. Hope you're all gonna do well. This will be a fun one. We're gonna talk about the life of the great Buster Keaton, the old stone face. Days with Jordan the Lion. It begins right now. And this is definitely not the first vlog we've done on Buster. We went to his plaque dedication ceremony, which is what this awesome poster is from. And we've also been to his birth town, the museum in his birth town. We've done quite a bit on Buster, so just gonna add to the stories. Oh, this ought to be a good day. I already see a little chase going on down there. He might want to get involved in that. So before we head out to the house, you know, a couple of funny little things about Buster Keaton. He was born Joseph Keaton, but his family was a vaudeville act. They were like a circus act, and they used to basically travel around in a traveling tent that would just set up in different towns. And um, he was born and into this family, and by the age of like two or three years old, he was part of the act, and they would throw him all over the stage, kick him, throw him out in the crowd, and actually when he was a kid, he broke his neck and didn't know it. Uh, that would be the first time he broke his neck and didn't know it for years. But when he was a little kid, he fell down a flight of steps, and his family was traveling and touring with Harry Houdini, and Harry Houdini said, wow, what a little buster, and that's how his name stuck. But since we're out here at the dog park, I'll also mention Buster had a lifelong love for dogs. And later on in his life, he was always surrounded by dogs and loved St. Bernard's. And the dog that was Beethoven in the Beethoven movies was actually um, one, I believe, a descendant raised by his wife, Eleanor, his widow, Eleanor. Hello there. See if he decides to do the ramp today. Ja, come here. Ja. <laughs> Guess not. I knew you'd do it. Good boy. Now, if you're not all that familiar with the name Buster Keaton, you should be because to me, he's as famous, as influential, and should be as popular as Charlie Chaplin. I think the only real difference was that Charlie Chaplin always smiled and Buster never smiled. And um, in the days of those silent pictures, a lot of people, a lot of the movies back then would have 250 cards telling the story of a movie and Buster Keaton's pictures only had 50. <laughs> he would tell the whole story with him, with his expressions and everything, and he said that he learned early on when he was a kid performing in front of people in, on stages that um, when he would do a bit, if he started laughing, people didn't laugh as much. They didn't find it as funny as if he kept a stone face, so that's basically what his trademark was. Now, he was a genius. He was, um, I hate to say writer, and I'll tell you why, but he was the filmmaker, he was the director, he was the star, he was the stuntman, and I hesitate to say writer because he would basically, with all of his self-produced pictures, um, or self-made pictures, he would always do um, basically just come up with the beginning idea and how he's gonna wrap up the story and then would create everything else as he went along filming the picture. Looks like a little puppy party back there. Now Buster Keaton, much like Charlie Chaplin, had his own outlet because uh, Charlie had his own studio and Buster had his own division of the studio he worked for. You see, he 
as he developed on stage, then got into movies, and he was best friends with Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, and Fatty was a big star in those days. And um, when Joseph Skank brought the whole production company out here to Los Angeles because they could film year-round, Fatty was his star, Buster came along, and Joseph Skank eventually ended up, um, or was married to Norma Talmadge. Buster Keaton would marry Natalie Talmadge, and so they would be brothers-in-law. So that's kind of how it happened, according to um, Buster's son's daughter. When I met them, they said that um, even though the Talmadge family kind of gets a bad rap, and, um, and I'll tell you kind of what the story on that was, um, if it weren't for the family affiliation of Buster marrying into the family and Joseph Skank being married into the family, that's what got Buster, Buster Keaton comedies, gave him his creative freedom because Joseph knew that Buster was able to run a studio like that. So um, basically what ended up happening though is that um, years of making his own pictures, doing his own stunts, he, he was a genius and he would spend so much time working on these pictures and everything um, that he wasn't home a whole lot. And when he was, he the old stories in the history books are always that he kind of got bossed around because the Talmadge family were three sisters and their mother who, um, their father had just cut out on them when they were young, so they were a very bonded family and apparently Buster had a hard time penetrating or having a voice in the mix of all that family. So. Um, when his career made a change, he ended up going to MGM. Um, his marriage fell apart and his wife, Natalie, decided to divorce him. He fell into strong alcoholism and um, she dropped the last name Keaton from his two sons. Um, his son Joseph would become Jim and they would their middle names were always Talmadge, last name Keaton. She just dropped the Keaton from both kids' names and they became Talmadge. Because despite Buster's success and all of the years of making great comedies and having a very, very nice home and estate, um, he would eventually basically lose everything and he would always attribute it to going over to MGM. When he went to MGM, they insisted on having people write the stories. Um, he was not allowed to do the stunts anymore. They would hire stunt people. They would tell him what pictures he was going to make. It really took all of his creativity and all of the fun out of the filmmaking process, which is, you know, what really, uh, between the end of his family and everything and the, the change and all that, that's really what kind of destroyed him. And despite all this, the guy, you know, throughout his life, he would um, very generously give money to his friends whose careers had been ruined when the talking pictures came about. I guess John found a friend. He will not leave this dog alone. He just keeps sniffing and sniffing and sniffing. <laughs> So we're heading off to Woodland Hills. Get a little taste of what Buster's neighborhood would have been like. I had no idea when I got here that I was gonna be telling you what I'm about to tell you. The address was 22612 and I couldn't believe it when I drove up here and saw they have demolished the house and they're building something else here now. This was where it was. So I'll have to show you some old pictures. I can't believe his last home is gone. I am really sorry, I had no idea. This is really heartbreaking. Um, you know, he basically had bottomed out as an alcoholic and um, ended up, while he was getting treatment, met the love of his life, Eleanor. And um, Eleanor basically helped change the tide in his life. And he ended up, um, he didn't direct, he didn't, you know, star in any pictures or anything, but he went back to work doing TV and working on stage and everything, so he kept his personality going, was able to earn money, but in the house I was hoping to show you, that was where he spent his last years of his life obsessing over playing the game Bridge and 
following baseball, the Dodgers. Now, I got to meet Buster's daughter-in-law, uh, his son. As I mentioned, when um, Natalie and Buster divorced, they basically cut Buster out of the kid's life completely. And when his son Jim was in the service, he married a girl he knew from high school, and he also decided while he was in India to try and contact his father and say that when he came back home, he wanted to see his father. So his, uh, his wife, <laughs> Jim's wife, said one day that he said, hey, we're gonna go see my dad today. And she said, what does Mr. Talmadge do? He said, Mr. Talmadge, his name's Keaton. And um, he lives here in LA. You see, she was raised in a family that was kind of poor and it was during the depression. She had never heard of Buster Keaton. She had never seen any of his movies. And uh, so her first trip over to this house was the first time she'd ever met him or experienced anything Buster. And she said he was just an absolutely delightful person. Um, so the first thing, of course, that he asked was, do you play bridge? And um, she said he never, and the whole time she knew him, never really saw him ever not be a nice guy. And she said that was a real testament because there was a time where she said he was living in the house with his wife, his mother, his sister, his brother, his brother's wife, and their kid, all of them in the same house, and still he would never leave or lose his cool or anything. And she said that they would often come over and play bridge. And she said the only time she really ever saw him lose his cool was to Jim. She said that, um, you know, Buster was a, a real stickler for the rules of bridge and he played it with his mom all the time who also lived in that house. He played it with his wife Eleanor who lived in that house. And um, so he just played bridge constantly. And even when he would go travel overseas to do shows, um, on the boat trips over and back and stuff, he would be playing bridge with people all, all along the way. And so he was just obsessing over it. And if you played bridge properly, if you were a good bridge player, you knew what was in everybody else's hand and he wouldn't play by the rules. And she said the only time she ever saw Buster kind of lose as cool as one time he said, damn it, Jim, can't you play by the rules? <laughs> she said, other than that, he was so nice. He was very approachable. I I've met people um, since I've lived out here that said that they used to live in this neighborhood and they would go over and ring his doorbell and he would come out and play hide and go seek with them. Um, they would play in the yard with him. He would do different things for Halloween. They would come trick or treating here. And, uh, and she said, yeah, he just played bridge a lot. They had a lot of uh, walnut trees here and he would gather up five pound bags of walnuts and give them out to friends for Christmas presents. Too bad that this house is gone. I was really looking forward to sharing a little bit, but online from like Google Maps and stuff, I can get you pictures and show you what it looked like. But um, Buster had some of his, probably his better, happier days out here in the valley. And uh, you know, <laughs> she said that uh, it was always a joy to come out here, but he always wanted her, he always wanted her to be on his team. And um, yeah, it's just, so sad to see how much of the history of this area is changing and everything and this was actually the house that Buster died in. He um, he had chronic bronchitis and he, so he thought that was what his what was ailing him at the end and the doctors found out that it was actually lung cancer and I guess even though they diagnosed it they didn't tell him and he ended up passing away here in 1966. Said at the time Buster moved here he was the only famous resident out here and he was the honorary mayor of Woodland Hills at the time and the first thing he did when he had this house he had a pool installed so he could swim every day which he did and chicken coops and had chickens all over the property as well as uh, fruit trees vegetables and of course those walnut trees yes all that's really left is this tree and the mailbox Buster ended up buying that house in 1956 after uh, coming back from a successful tour with what he said was Paramount's money and then all of his appearances on like Truth or Consequence and all the game shows and everything is what they used, that money was what they used to furnish the house. Speaking of mailboxes, that's an interesting one. Shamu. Take a look at this house. This is nice and uplifting. They got a horse here and then a bunch of love and hearts and everything hanging in the trees. Nice and uplifting. I know many of you are tired of hearing me say it, but this is kind of one of the reasons that I wanted to leave Los Angeles and why I am moving is because just too many instances I get so excited to go see something and then find out that it's already gone or 
just seeing constantly the historic homes and the buildings and the famous structures of this town just being demolished with no regard for the history. So it's just kind of heartbreaking like it was today. Had no idea that we were going to walk into that. So once again, I apologize you didn't get to see it in person. And these are the kind of reasons why I go out and try and vlog things because you just never know what week it will be gone. Well, my friends, we're going to call it a day. You win some, you lose some. Thank you, Julie Frost, Jason Thomas, and Judy Pesky Furo for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great night, and goodbye.